good morning. Good morning. We are going to get right into it. If you have a Bible, John 4, 23 to 24, this is our banner verse. Jesus says this, yet the time is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Indeed, the Father is looking for people like that to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must, let me hear you say the word must, Must. worship in spirit and truth. This is the word of the Lord today. Over the last uh, several weeks, if you're new, maybe just hopping in, I'll, I'll just fill you in. We're in a series right now called Build This House. The house that we're talking about building is God's house, the church. We are God's house. Like we are the living stones, uh, Uh, Peter says, and when we come together, person by person, living stone by living stone, we become the very house of God. And then we just started asking, okay, well, like, what does that mean? Does God have preferences? What type of house does he want to build? And that sent sent us on a journey. We've talked about being a house of hope, love, faith, generosity, integrity. And today, I want to talk to us about building a house of worship. Building a house of worship. In fact, this topic is, is so large, we've decided to kind of split it into two different parts. Uh, so this week, you're going to get part one of building a house of worship, and next week, you're going to get part two. House of worship. This is what we're talking about today. Now, what can make this a little bit tricky is the word worship, right? Um, and the reason why is because it, even in our scriptures, it can almost be one of those words. It's like a catch-all word. Like it can kind of encompass many different things, many different thoughts. And because of that, we, sometimes we, we, we don't exactly know what we're uh, specifically addressing. So today what I wanted to do is give you a very simple and very profound definition of worship that's going to set everything up. Here it is. Write this down if you're taking notes. Jan, I see that you're taking notes again. (laughs) Gary, I see that you're not. I see everything from up here, okay? (laughs) Everything. (laughs) All right, here's our definition. Worship is worship. Worship is worship. Worship is simply expressing what something is worth to you. Worship is, is showing what something means to you. It's what you, it's what you value. Worship is worship. Let me give you a, an example. Um, I love football. Any football fans? 10% of the crowd. Okay. Uh, there's this thing that happens, right, when your team scores a touchdown. Now, this is something that apparently my team, the Green Bay Packers, have completely forgotten this season how to do. But when your team scores a touchdown, what do you do? Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, unless you were a Lions fan last week, there wasn't really a lot of cheering, was there? That's okay. You're much better than my team. All right. That's worship. That's worship. When you're favorite artist or your favorite band. You go to a concert and they walk out on the stage, right? What do you do? You're like, (laughs) Taylor Swift, oh my goodness. That's worship. If you won the lottery today, you'd be running around the room screaming. That's worship. Now, these are actually very good examples of worship. The problem is that these things can be very bad gods, Right? You kind of understand? Like, bad guys. We have this problem right now in our world, in our culture, where we give really good worship to really bad gods. And sometimes the opposite can be true in the church. Where we give really bad worship, or lackadaisical worship, or apathetic worship to a really good God. Like, we must, in the words of Jesus himself, we must learn how to actually become a house of worship, how to build a house of worship. So why don't you go back with me into John chapter 4. Today what I want to do is I want to 
walk us through a story. Like we already kind of read the kind of like the banner verse, but that's one verse in the middle of a really amazing story. Uh, one of my favorite Jesus stories that we have. And so I want us to kind of see the whole picture and then we're going to talk about worship a little bit more. Here in this story, Jesus tackles, he addresses the topic of worship head on. But it starts like this. John 4, verse 1. It says, now when Jesus realized that the Pharisees had heard that he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus who did the baptizing but his disciples, he left Judea and went back to Galilee. Now it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. Now, now, now that line right there, it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria probably doesn't mean anything to you unless you understand the context. You see, in the first century, Jews and, and Samaritans were like enemies. I, honestly, like they had a strong, rooted, uh, at times almost hatred for, for one another. I, I think it was in the Jewish Mishnah uh, it actually says that if you ate the bread of a Samaritan, that it was equal to eating the flesh of pigs and rats. Okay, that's like there were prayers being offered up that we actually have recordings of, not like audio recordings. We have like, like written down recordings of Jewish prayers being offered up at the temple for God not to give forgiveness to the Samaritans. Now that's pretty, str- that's like a strong level of hatred. When you're praying for God to damn an entire people, right? But this is what's going on. This, like they were, they were enemies. And you have to understand why. The, the, the Samaritans were considered like half-breed Jews. What they had done is they'd taken the doctrines that the Jewish people lived by, the doctrines about who God is, Yahweh, and they perverted them. And this was creating all sorts of tensions. So what the Jews figured out is here's what we can do. We can build a road all the way around Samaria so that we never have to engage with those people. So that's what they did. They built this road that went all the way around those people. So imagine the disciples' surprise when they hit the fork in the road. They turned left, but Jesus turned right. Imagine how confusing the moment must have been for them when, when they, they hit that fork in the road. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. listen, guys. Um, we need to go through Samaria. He says, it's necessary. Some translations said, like, he, he said, we must go through Samaria. Just in passing, I love when following Jesus that we don't avoid the cultural tensions of the day. When, when following Jesus, we don't go around the issues of the day. If, if, when following Jesus, we go through Samaria. As uncomfortable as Samaria may be, <laughs> we go through Samaria. Jesus is going to model for us a whole new way of living in this passage. Pick, uh, pick it up with me in verse 5. So we came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the piece of land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was also there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Verse 7 says, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. So there, there's some stuff going on here. Jesus, like enter into the story right now. Uh, Jesus finds himself at a well at noon when a Samaritan woman comes to the well at what time? Noon. This is important to the story because here's what happens at noon. If you don't know, the sun is at its highest point. At noon, it's one of the hottest points of the day. Women in the first century, they don't go to wells at noon. They'll go in the morning or they'll go in the evening when it's cooler outside. But this woman finds herself at the well at the wrong time, wrong time, right? He, she, she, she's there during the hottest point of the day. Like, why is she there at noon? 
It's a really good question, and we're about to find out in this story, but let's just keep reading. So Jesus told her, please give me a drink, since his disciples had gone off into the town to to buy food. The Samaritan woman asked him, how can you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a Samaritan woman? Because Jews do not have anything to do with Samaritans. Now, Parkwood, she's right. Like, she is picking up on everything that I just told you about this tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. But she's only scratching the surface. Yes, she's right in saying, how can you, a Jew, ask me a Samaritan? She could have also asked, how can you, a man, ask me a woman? She could have asked, how can you, a rabbi, ask me a lower class citizen? There were so many reasons why this story should have never taken place. There were so many cultural barriers, these walls that came up uh, that, that should have stopped Jesus from ever interacting with this woman. But what I love about Jesus is there is no, like there is no wall big enough that he's not willing to break down. There's, there's, there's no cultural uh, division that he's not willing to walk through. He, a Jewish male rabbi, starts talking to a lower-class Samaritan woman. It's like this in the first-century context is staggering. She is absolutely right in this moment to be confused over what Jesus is doing. And and, and, and as it goes on, I I love, so Jesus says, you know, can you get me some water? She flips out. She's like, no, how can you, a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan? But then what Jesus does from verses 10 to 15 is amazing. He looks at this woman, and he said, if you only knew who who I am, if you only knew who was asking you for water, you would be the one asking me. And he says, the water that I would give you would would create in you like a well that like burst up to eternal life. Jesus says to this woman, he says, I'm the type of water that if you drink from, you will never thirst again. This woman, she's like, oh, (laughs) I want this water. Whatever this is that you're talking about, I want it. I'm tired of coming here at the midday. It's hot. I'm sweaty. I I would love water like this. And Jesus says, all right, you want the water? First, we got to deal with an issue. I love, look at this, verse 16. He told her, go and call your husband and come back here. The woman answered him, I don't have a husband. Jesus told her, you're quite right in saying that I don't have a husband because you've had five husbands and the man uh, you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. (laughs) Jesus is sneaky sometimes. (laughs) You know? He's like, all right, you want the water? Go call your... He knows, right? He knows her situation, right? He exposes it. She says, I don't have a husband. He's like, yeah, you've had five. And the man you're with right now, you're not even married to him. Like, like you're moving from person. Like, Jesus exposes something inside of her. Like, like it, it, but, but it's right here inside of this passage that we find out why she's going to the well at noon. It's right here that we see. You see, Um, she's there at noon because if she goes in the morning or in the evening when all of the other women would go out to get the water, she's there at noon because if she she goes at those other times, she's going to get talked about. You see, this, this lifestyle that she's engaged in moving from man to man to man to man to man to meet some sort of temporal need, like in doing so, she's built up a reputation for herself that's not good. So what she does, she waits, and she waits, and she waits some more. And finally, when she gets to a spot where she's convinced herself that nobody is going to be at the well, I see where the sun is, it's blazing hot, now I can go, and who does she find? (laughs) Jesus. Oh, Parker, can I just share for a moment? Man, there is nowhere that we can ever go to escape his presence. Nowhere. Jesus shows up at wells at noon. 
And if Jesus can show up at a well at noon in the hottest point, there is nowhere that we can go to escape his presence. There is, like, you can't hide from him. Like, for some of us, we're like this Samaritan woman, right? We're like, ah, if I just wait back. Like, no, you, you can't wait long enough. You can't hide good enough. <laughs> he is the one person that will always be there. She waits, and she waits, and she waits until no one's going to be there, and then she goes, and who does she find? God in flesh is waiting for her. You, look, you, you, you got to imagine when Jesus said to the disciples, hey, I know you're used to walking around Samaria. No, 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 it's necessary that we go through. It's this moment that he had in mind. Jesus is not avoiding the cultural issues. He's, he's heading right for it. I absolutely love it. Now, as we go on, um, I want you to see what's going to happen. We're, we're, we're going to pick it up in verse 19. The woman told him, Sir, I see that you're a prophet. Come on, that's funny. <laughs> that's just funny. Like, Jesus has just, ex- like, just... Let's, like he just, you ever have that moment? It's like where you're seen, you're caught. You ever have a moment like that? It's like where everything you were hiding like came out. It's like Jesus just laid out this woman's life on a platter right in front of her. And she says, yeah, I see you're one of those prophets. Okay, okay. And then she tries to change the subject. Verse 20, she says, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say the place where you should worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, dear lady, the hour is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You don't know what you're worshiping. We, Jews, know what we're worshiping because salvation comes from the Jews. Yet, and here's our big verse, yet a time is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Indeed, the Father is looking for such people to worship him or for people like that to worship him. Verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must. Let me hear you just one more time say must. Must. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Parkwood, when, when Jesus says here that God is spirit, it's important that we know kind of what he's saying. Um, When Jesus says that God is spirit, he's not saying that God is a ghost, like this kind of like see-through, ethereal being, and maybe you'll catch a glimpse. Maybe you, That's not what he's saying. He's, what, what, what Jesus is saying is that God is in a completely different category. Like God is qualitatively other. He's, he's saying like God, God is not made up of the same thing that human beings are made up of. He's saying like he's in a different category. He's in a different column. He's in a different bracket. He's not confined to time and space and matter like we are. God is spirit, okay? God is something else. And it's really, really hard to put into words what he is because he's just something else. And then he says, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So the big question today that I want to explore out of this text is just what does that mean? When, when, like apparently it's really important. Right? Jesus says, we must worship him this way. What is it? How do we become a church that, uh, that, that worships in spirit and in truth? Well, it's actually not all that complicated, but I think it is worth exploring. How we worship God in spirit and in truth is worshiping God with our hearts and our minds. Okay? It's, it's, there's, there's kind of two different components there. Uh, l- l- let me explain. I, I've been in the church world long enough uh, to know that when it comes to the topic of worship, we have preferences, right? Uh, like, even just with your personality, uh, some of you are more reserved, some of you are more, more outgoing. We got the introverts, the extroverts. How many people are introverts? Yeah, raise those hands. You're my people. <laughs> Everyone else? You're not my people. Right, but like God's given us, like he's just created us certain ways, but that even plays into worship, right? Like, like for, for some of you, when we come to worship and you're like, man, like here, you know what Parkwood needs? 
Parkwood needs longer, better sermons. And if Danny would just preach longer and better, then we would be the church that God wants us to be. You know what you are? You're head people. You're, you're head people. Um, for, for, for others of you, you're, you're honest. Or you're like, man, I don't get that at all. Why does Danny even have to preach at all? We could just hold hands and sing songs and cry. You know, give each other hugs. It's going to be amazing. Okay, you're heart people. Okay, now here's the thing. Both are good. Both are needed. Both are actually a must from God. The problem is you can't pick and choose. Even if your personality, you tend to lean in one of those two different directions, you can't pick and choose. We must be a people who worships God in spirit and in truth with our hearts and our heads, okay? We need both of these. So so what I want to do for the next little bit together is I just want to explore these two different thoughts. I I want us to take a few minutes and just kind of wade into these waters here and see what we can learn. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's my first point. We must worship God with informed minds. One of the critiques sometimes of the charismatic church (laughs) is that in our worship, we're just mindless. Uh, That's, that might happen some places. I'm telling you, that's not what Jesus is wanting. Like, it's not this spot where we like divorce our mind from our feelings, right? We worship in spirit and in truth, always truth. We never lose truth, ever. What's interesting, this woman at the well You go back just into her story. She had serious issues with worshiping God with an informed mind. Serious issues. She she was misinformed, probably from birth. From the day that she was born, she was taught something that was wrong. She grew up a Samaritan woman. She grew up, she was one of those considered half-breed Jews that really they did pervert the doctrines of Yahweh. That was, her, that was her mind. That was her thought. That was her understanding. She just couldn't see it that way. So what Jesus does is he just calls it out like a boss. Look at verse 22. Look, look what he says to her. He says, you don't know what you're worshiping. We, we Jews know what we're worshiping because salvation comes from the Jews. Anyone, you ever read these stories at times and you're like, man, isn't it awesome how blunt Jesus is? Like, like, he looks at this woman. They're in the middle of this dialogue. She wants to talk about worship, so he's like, all right, let's talk about worship. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so it's like, like you, you, you are completely missing the point. You, you don't know what worship is. We do. He says salvation is from the Jews. Like, like and so I know somebody here, you're just thinking, oh, why would Jesus attack this poor lady that's coming to the well at noon? Clearly she's got some issues. Just back off, Jesus. No. Hey, Jesus is not, first of all, Jesus is not attacking this lady at all. Jesus loves this lady, and because he loves this lady, he's willing to attack the wrong thinking in her mind. Jesus, he's willing to go to uncomfortable places and say uncomfortable things at times in love. It's important that you understand here, uh, Jesus is not a jerk, okay? Because some of you, you honestly might have just placed him in that, in that category. He's not. Jesus always speaks the truth in love, always. And because he loves her, he's willing, uh, he's willing to expose the wrong thinking because, Parkwood, you cannot worship God rightly if your thinking is wrong. I'm going to say that again. You cannot worship God rightly if your thinking is wrong. This is why Jesus says those who worship God must worship in truth, not should we must figure out what is the truth and go after that. Like, so years ago, um, I was playing tennis with some buddies, and we uh, went to the tennis courts. Any, any tennis people? Wow. 
Wow, I don't, did I get a single hand? You guys need to like go do something. I got one person over there, all right. Well, you know, I'm not even a tennis guy. <laughs> um, but we went on that day and it was a beautiful day. And you'll know this if you play tennis. Sometimes when you go to like city courts, uh, they're just overrun. So we showed up to play tennis. All the courts were taken. So there's this group of people sitting on the grass waiting to actually go in and play. And so uh, we joined the group and we're just sitting there and everyone's having a really nice time just waiting, you know, for the next group to leave. And all of a sudden this young man stands up and he's talking really loud. Yeah, any of you, you're loud talkers, yeah? This guy's a loud, my daughter, she's like, my whole life is Nora, indoor voice, indoor voice. Like some of us, we just have outdoor voices all the time. This guy was outdoors and he had a really loud outdoor voice. And he starts talking to one person, then it kind of turned into like a much bigger thing. And I'm just watching this. And he starts telling this story about how like, yeah, I was born and raised a Muslim. And then I left the Muslim faith because none of it made any sense. And, 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 then, he, and then he said, in fact, none of the world religions make any sense. And any religion that tells you that, that, that they have like the market on the truth and they figured it out and they're the only way, run from them, you know? Every, every religion is teaching the same thing and they just don't know it. It's like we're all climbing up the same mountain, but we're just taking different paths. Anybody ever hear this before? Yeah, so this guy is now preaching to a crowd of people, and I'm sitting there listening to him, and, and honestly, for a while, I just let it go, like completely let it go, because it wasn't all that personal. He's just making big statements, and, 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 and then all of a sudden, he shifted, and he says, and don't get me started on the Christians in Jesus, and he starts just gunning for Jesus, and he's, and he's like calling like, like, we, there's no proof for the resurrection. Uh, we don't even have proof that says that Jesus ever existed. He might have been a made-up figure long ago. And he's, and he's just going on. And he's got his own little congregation on the grass. They didn't, they didn't want this. They're just showing up to play tennis. And this guy is preaching a full-on heretical sermon. And there was just something happened in me. As I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this guy start railing on Jesus, and I'm just not one of those guys. Like, I don't love confrontation, but I'm also not going to run from it. And there was something there that day. And uh, I don't know. I just stood up in front of everybody that day and just said, hey, buddy, like, if you're going to spout off information, at least, like, check your sources. Nothing you've said is right nothing. And I can show you, like, bam, bam, bam. And now you have, no, thank you. Now you have this entire group of people that aren't watching tennis. They're just watching me and this dude <laughs> going back and forth. And, and it was amazing, actually, with this, with this man, like, how fast he just, like, shut up. Because, like, his points, like, he just, you can tell he went down some really weird, like, Google rabbit trail. There was no substance behind it. He didn't know how to back up any of his points. And the moment he was confronted, he crumbled. Listen, so you say, well, Danny, why are you being such a jerk? Why, why couldn't you just let him have his moment? Why, why do you have to attack the man? Friend, I never attacked the man. Never. But I will attack wrong thinking. In love, why? Because truth matters. And listen, I don't think every moment needs to be this big public thing like that was, but there are moments when we need to speak up in love because you cannot worship God rightly if your thinking is wrong. We must be a church that learns how to worship God with an informed mind. So, okay, well, how do we do that? How do we inform our mind? Well, the primary way is you need to get in the word. You need to get in the word. You don't, and when I mean this, like don't, some of us, here's what we do. It's like a pool. And we're just like dipping our toe in. We're like see if it's, this is weird. 
It really is. <laughs> But this is a weird way to read the scriptures. You don't, you don't dip your toe in the scriptures. You dive in. You swim in the scriptures. I mean, the scriptures. Like, like, like it, is, it is God's revelation to us. It is God's great exhalation to us. It is, it, is, it is an ocean of depth about the one from whom we were all made. Don't dip your toe. Swim. Know God, read about God, study God. Find out who he is, his characters, his plans, his purposes. That's how we inform our mind. And I promise you this, that if you're not doing that, if you're not growing in your knowledge of Jesus, you will never grow in your worship of Jesus. The two must go hand in hand. But this is the first way that we worship. Jesus says we must worship with informed minds. But if that's all we do, it's still not enough. Here's my second point today. We must worship God with inflamed hearts. We must. I want you to think about this lady. The church has been talking about this Samaritan woman for 2,000 years. And there's a lot of stuff we don't know about her. We don't know her name. We don't know her age. We don't know, uh, a, we don't know a lot about this woman. Here's what we do know. We know that this woman had an encounter with the living God, Christ, God in the flesh. She had an encounter with God at a well at noon that completely changed her life. And here we are talking about her 2,000 years later. In fact, if you go back with me into this text, right where we left off, Jesus then reveals to her that he is the Christ. Right after he said, listen, those who worship must worship in spirit and truth, she still tries to dodge it. And she says, you know what? One day the Messiah is going to come. And when he comes, he'll tell us all about this. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm him. I'm him. I'm the one that everyone has been waiting for. I'm him. And she has this moment where she sees for the first time. She has this moment where her thinking is, is right for the first time. She sees God. She understands God. And then it says this in verse 28. It says, Then the woman left her water jar and went back to town. I love that. Why did she go to the well? To get water. She leaves her water jar at the well. Why? Because she found something better than water. She found the living water. She, she doesn't need the jar anymore. I, I love this. And then verse 29, it, it says this, that she, she ran back. She tells the people, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. <laughs> Could he possibly be the Messiah? Parker, do you know what this is? This is an inflamed heart. This is passion. This right here is worship. See it. She runs back to the very people that she was hiding from just moments earlier. You gotta understand the whole story. She waited and waited and waited until nobody else would be there because she doesn't want to be with people. She doesn't want to get talked about. But she has one interaction with God, one moment with God, one, one moment where, where everything's laid bare. She sees him, and now she runs back to those very people she was hiding from, and she has a message. She says, I met a man. Oh, I met a man. I love it. She says, not another man to sleep with, not another man to meet some sort of temporal need. She says, I met a man who told me everything about myself. And she says, you gotta come meet him. You gotta come meet him. As the story goes on, like a whole group of people go out and find Jesus and many people get saved. Because Jesus walked through Samaria. 
we worship God with an informed mind. And yes, it's very important. We worship God with an inflamed heart. How, how did it happen? Like, like how, how did this woman start worshiping the right God the right way? in spirit and in truth, with an informed mind and an inflamed heart. How did it happen? Well, it happened because the one who knew her best loved her most. The one who knew her best loved her most. The one who knew every single thing about her, every sin she had committed, was committing, or probably one day would commit. He, he saw it all. The one who knew her best loved her most. Parkwood, can I just say this? Because somebody needs to hear it right now. The one who knows you best loves you most. Like God sees you. All of you. There's not a thing that, that, that he misses. He sees you everything, all your hurts, your habits, your hangups. He sees all of it and he's not running away. In fact, it's the opposite. He's going through Samaria. He's running to you. And listen, I just believe that if Jesus could show up at a well at noon in Samaria, then he can show up here today. I just, I, I, I believe it, I feel it in the same way that God showed up to that broken woman long ago. He is showing up to people with a message and it says, I know you better than anybody. I see everything and yet I'm still here. I'm not leaving. I'm not going away and I'll always be here waiting. It's Jesus saying, this is who I am. The one who knows you best loves you the most. And Parkwood, if that doesn't cause us to worship with an inflamed heart, I don't know what will. God loves you. He sees you. All of you. And he's running right for you. The one who knows you best loves you most. Can we stand up all across this room? Worship is worship. Worship is expressing what something is worth to you. It's showing what something means to you. It's prioritizing that value, right? You'll find out very quick like what you worship. Worship is worth. Ship. So here's the question that all of us have to ask. What is Jesus worth to you? What is Jesus worth to you? What does Jesus mean to you? When you gather in this place, when we come, do you worship or do you sing songs? Those are two different things. Do you watch a band or do you worship? <laughs> worship is worship. If Jesus is Lord of your life, if he has saved you, redeemed you, if he's walking with you and growing you, if he has a plan for you, like if we can look back and see everything he's done, then church, I want to call us to worship. If you place a high value on Jesus Christ, then he deserves our worship. And I'll tell you this, he deserves our worship more than the Detroit Lions do. He deserves our worship more than the Green Bay Packers do. He deserves our worship more than Taylor Swift does. He deserves all of our worship. He is God. He is King. He is Lord. Taylor Swift doesn't know who Danny Gray is. Jesus does. And what we need to do is we need to get to a spot where we, where we are placing more worth over our creator than we are his creation. God, help us when we get this mixed up. God, forgive us 
for worshiping the things of this world more than we do our heavenly Father. What is Jesus worth to you? I, I love in um, the scriptures, kind of in the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, there's this image that it says that our prayers and our worship become like incense into the very throne room of God, which is, which is like an amazing image that like what happens here now contributes to the aroma in heaven. <laughs> you ever think about that? Like, Parkwood, what happens here now contributes to the aroma. I love that. I love that. It's like incense that rises into the throne room of God. Jesus says, like, when my people worship my name. <laughs> oh, it changes things. It, it changes things here. It contributes to the atmosphere up there. <sighs> it's worship. It's worship. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship. We're going to take some time before we leave, and we are going to we are gonna lay ourselves before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I believe that God is calling us back to his side. And listen, if you've given more worship to Taylor Swift or to a football team or to any other thing, <laughs> any other thing, then this moment is your moment to come home. This moment is your moment to bring worship to where it is due, to God and to God alone. So listen, as we sing this song, as incense rises, if you want to sit, sit. If you want to stand, stand. If you want to come forward, listen, these altars right here are open. Sometimes it's just a physical act that's needed to place our worth upon God. But in these next few moments, don't miss it. I said this in the nine o'clock. Who cares what the person next to you thinks. Who cares? The only thing that we should be concerned of in this moment is what God thinks and what God sees. And like, like we are here, church, for him and only him. So in these next few moments, I pray that incense would rise. I pray that our worship would rise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he alone is worth it.